Now, did you hear the one about the stand-up comedian who couldn't speak? No, it's not a joke, though he is very, very funny. 31-year-old Lee Ridley did his first gig only a few months ago, but he's become so popular. He's now headlining in his hometown of Newcastle, performing all over the country, including, yes, at the Edinburgh Fringe in August. Lee has cerebral palsy and can't speak, so he uses a voice synthesizer. Our reporter Bob Dixon met Lee at one of his gigs at the Maltings in Berwick-upon-Tweed. Guys, are you ready for your headline act of the evening? Yeah! Are you ready to see something awesome? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Lost Boy Sky! It's Saturday night at the Maltings Arts Centre and the audience at the Laughing Bear Comedy Club are being treated to stand-up as they've never seen it before. In case you were still in any doubt, I really am disabled. It's definitely not just really good acting. <laughs> And I'm not just in it for the parking space. <laughs> From a modest start in a Newcastle comedy venue back in February, the Lost Voice guy, as Lee Ridley is known, is now in demand all over the country. Armed with a voice synthesizer linked to an iPad that makes him sound a bit like Stephen Hawking, he's challenging audiences by meeting the issues of his own disability head on. When I realised I'd never be able to talk again, I was speechless. I began to try to communicate through the medium of dance. A bit like Strictly Come Dancing crossed with Give Us a Clue. People just thought I was taking an epileptic fit. I was ill when I was six months old and as a result I developed cerebral palsy. As a result I am unable to speak and I walk quite funny. My right side of my body is weaker too. Given these challenges, why did you want to become a stand-up comic? I've always loved watching stand-up comedy and I guess it was my dream job. I never thought I'd do it though. Then some friends suggested I try it so I thought I might as well. Your act doesn't shy away from disability issues. How important is it for a comedian in your situation to meet these issues head on. I just think it gives me something quite unique to joke about. I've lived with it for 31 years, so I've got plenty of material from it. I think it was important to show that there's a funny side to disability too. Do you think sometimes that members of the audience get a bit uncomfortable about you taking the mickey out of yourself and your disability? I think I can get away with it more because I make it about myself. I guess some people might get uncomfortable, but I hope that that soon goes away when they realize what I'm trying to do. I've had a positive response so far. I hate that we have so many politically correct words to describe disabled people now. Now it's all special needs, special schools, special Olympics. <laughs> That is why it always alarms me when I hear about special forces going to war. <laughs> well, the electronic voice box is a central part of your act. How does it work? How many jokes have you got stored on it? I just type them into the machine and it stores them. Then I just press each one when I want it to play it. So far I've got 30 minutes worth of material, but I'm always thinking of new ideas. Timing is everything for a comedian, so are there special challenges with timing, given that you have to press the button every time you want to tell a joke? Yes, it's sometimes hard to know when to pause and allow laughter and when not to. I think it's just trial and error, really. I'm getting more used to knowing which jokes will cause a big laugh. Let's be realistic. You wouldn't want me to be guiding you through a minefield or trying to talk a suicide bomber out of blowing themselves up. However, if you gave me a gun, at least the Americans would have someone else to blame for friendly fire. I wish I had the invention and the commitment and the wonderful push that he's got. You know, like he's literally overcome a disability to be a stand-up comedian. Amazing, completely different to what I thought it was going to be. The self-deprecating nature of everything, the fact that he was just willing to take the piss out of himself. 
A lot of people might have felt quite uncomfortable about the content of his act, even although he was taking the mickey out of himself. It's the 21st century and I think that we're still not quite over that taboo of people with disability speaking about it. It was much, much better than I'd anticipated. It's the, the way that he tackles the subject that a lot of people would find taboo and I think a lot of people were maybe scared to laugh because if anyone else had said them, they could be considered offensive. Discriminatory, but the way that he's getting those subjects out there and making them public, I think it's an excellent thing. What I think impressed me most about him was the fact that he's not sitting there wallowing in self-pity and feeling sorry for himself. He's actually out there celebrating what's happened to him and enjoying his life and making other people laugh and making them happy with what, what's happened to him. Did you in your wildest dreams, as someone who has cerebral palsy, you've got no voice, ever expect to be standing up on stages up and down the country making people laugh? Not at all. Ever since my first gig in February, it's all been very surreal. I just thought I'd give it a try and see what happened. I never expected to get this much attention. I'd like to think that I can show that anything can be achieved by anybody if you put your mind to it. I also think I'd like to show people that disabled people are just like everybody else. What has the success of the past few months meant to you? It's meant an awful lot both in terms of being able to make people laugh and in terms of overcoming my disability. It's just such a great buzz knowing that I can make other people laugh. I'm in a very happy place right now. It seems that Lost Voice Guy Lee Ridley really has become something to shout about. Ladies and gentlemen, I have been Lost Voice Guy. If you find my voice, please contact me on my website or on my Facebook page. I hope you enjoy the rest of your night. Goodbye. A uh, flavour there of what Lee Ridley does. Now, he is doing two Edinburgh Festival fringe shows. You fancy seeing him. Those are on the 8th and the 15th of August at the City Cafe. My thanks to our reporter Bob Dixon for that report. And uh, more details soon about those fringe shows and indeed everything else about Lee, including videos at his excellent website, which is called lostvoiceguy.com. And uh, listening to that report, and with me now are Simon Minty, who is a producer and part time performer with the stand up group Abnormally Funny People. Susie Fitton is here. She's Senior Policy Advisor at Capability Scotland and Michael McEwen is presenter at ABLE Radio. So Simon, uh, first of all, interesting report that. Have you seen Lee do his stand-up routine? I've not seen him live. I've heard bits uh, as you've just had and yeah. uh, we are very proud he came and did his first London show uh, at the gig that we run at the Soho Theatre for Abnormally Funny People. Yeah. But I was unfortunately abroad the day that he came. Drat. Yes. Um, but interesting I think from that report to hear the, the response, I mean you could just hear pe the, the laughter during the act and then the response of people afterwards saying yeah it's, it's like a no brainer, the guy is funny, more of this please. Um, Yes, I, uh, well, absolutely. I think the, the fact that he owns the material, it is his material, I don't... I mean, there'll be one or two people who might get a bit worried, but there's... He's not being demeaning, I don't think. He's just kind of having fun and teasing, so I, I don't really think it's terribly risque, in, 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 well, from my point of view. Yeah, indeed. Uh, I was going to say to, to Michael, who's sitting with me here in Glasgow, who's a radio presenter, and you also have cerebral palsy, yeah. so it must be interesting for you... Um, listening to him. I mean, he, he can't actually speak, so he's using the voice synthesizer. But what do you make of what you've heard there of his material, the fact that he is using his own disability as, as a lot of the focus for the comedy? Well, first of all, I would like to say um, these kids got the coin skins. Uh, could go up in front of millions of people and, and act, you know? Yeah. Um, no, I, I, think it, I think it's a good thing. Um, you know, as Simon said, it could be gig or bag you know but um yeah i mean look b because people think uh, about people with disabilities can't do anything can't work can't go out can't do this x y and z but yeah it's, it's a good thing you yeah know? yeah i mean susie i guess we're, we're talking about comedy because it's the comedy cafe and the bottom line there is if you're up on stage what's really key no matter who you are is you're funny or not, but I guess also, looking beyond that, this must be a very useful tool in terms of breaking down barriers with people. Absolutely. We've got a media narrative that often depicts disabled people as either brave, pitiable, in need of charity, or as benefit scroungers. This type of comedy throws all that stale water out. It yeah. d debunks stereotypes, and it sees comedians like 
constantly using their experiences of impairments to make us all laugh at life. You can't complain about that, really. Yeah. I mean, this, Simon, this must be something that you're, you're absolutely au fait with, and I guess that... Um, I'm just wondering about your, with your own stand-up act, how much of that is, is disability-focused and how much is not? Uh, I'm probably 70-80% disability-focused. Uh, yes, I'm au okay fait with it. There's, I, there's a sort of responsibility I always... I feel personally, which is, if I make a joke, um, if someone else was, I don't know, to tease a child with, I, I have dwarfism, so I'm about three foot eleven uh, inches tall. Yeah. Would that, if that joke was sort of thrown at somebody in a playground or a child and stuff, so there's, there is a little barrier, an invisible barrier that I have, where I kind of go, okay, that's that's cheapening it now, or yeah. or that's not witty enough, or that's not playing on the stereotypes, which is uh, what Lee is doing. So I do have a boundary and you know, sort of expectations, but I. I, well, I guess able-bodied people would have the same uh, b boundaries and, and, and thinking about the, the repercussions outside of the, I, I guess, what can be a cosy atmosphere in a comedy club. As you say, there, there could be repercussions taken out of context. Yes, although I do think the order, when we had uh, Lee down at Abnormally Funny People, they, we were sold out. It was the first time we'd been absolutely sold out and rammed for a long time. Yeah. Very young people came, when I say very young, I don't know, early 20s. Um, but the bit that was, was great, they just kind of got it. But I do think other people put a limit on um, what is acceptable or not regarding disability. Uh, the comments at some of the end of the, the piece you did was, you know, he's overcome a disability. Oh, right. mm. Where's well, he? He's just using yeah. technology, which yeah. is great. What he's trying to overcome is other people's hang-ups about it. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, um, Michael, do you find that, that there's this... I mean, do you think we'll ever get to the stage where, uh, I guess, if you're up on, on stage and being a comedian who happens to be disabled, there's that whole thing of maybe an extra responsibility of making the audience feel comfortable about it. You can't just get up like a regular person and just get on with it. It'd be great to get beyond that point. Yeah, it's all right. Um, um, a lot of people say, well, um, he's got a disability. Put him in a box, yeah. basically, you know, but you want to um, break into the mainstream uh, kind of field. Um, and, and stuff like that, and I'd be great to see more of that in the future. Yeah. Uh, somebody from Scotland or, or whoever, you yeah. know. Yeah. Do you think, it's Susie, are we making progress with this, though? I guess the more comedians do it, the more aspiring comedians who happen to be dis disabled who might have thought, mm, I'm not sure if this is for me, might be too many obstacles to overcome. I think, actually, yeah, I'm going to do this. I think so. I think it, you, it, you're breaking down barriers and Lee's opening doors for other people, potentially other people who use communication aids, who have, uh, for one reason or another, thought that a, a live performance was not necessarily an option for them. Yeah. I mean, he himself has talked about the fact that he didn't, ne he didn't think that, uh, that going on stage was going to be something he was able to do. Um, but I, you know, I... I I get concerned about the idea of people being pigeonholed as mm -hmm. disabled comedians. Yeah. I think if you've got something funny to say about life and stand-up is your way of expressing that, then uh, having an impairment should in no way stop you from doing it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's Simon, presumably this is something you've thought about long and hard because you have actually got uh, a group of, well, the disabled and non-disabled comedians, yeah. but under that, that heading of abnormally funny people. So I suppose you're setting up something being a bit different from the start. Yes, it, it, we always have what we call our token non-disabled person. <laughs> we we want to be inclusive and give everyone a chance. But the bit that, that uh, it, there's a good and bad bit. The, when I heard the comments at the end, that they were exactly the same as when we did our first show in Edinburgh seven years ago from the, the general public. And I thought, oh my goodness, nothing's moved on. But there'll be other comedians in 1998 would say the same. The bit that I do like though is there are more and more comedians with a disability who are kind of getting up doing stuff. They are doing our show, but they're doing mainstream shows. Yeah. Yeah. Up to wider. So I love the fact that there's more and more of us that will mean, you know, I don't want to buy into all that, but gradually it will become just a bit straightforward and you are funny or you're not and it won't be so unique or whatever. Yeah. Um, just, just thinking again about, um, you know, comedy, Simon, taking disability as a focus. And of course, this is, whole idea has been in the, uh, the news for all the wrong reasons when it comes to, you know, here we go again, I'm saying those names, but Frankie Boyle and Ricky Gervais mm -hmm. and making comments which many people have found uh, offensive. What's your stance on, on those people? Kind of, I mean, they're, they're very different actually, aren't they, in what they've done? But what, what's your sort of reaction to that? 
Oh, very Too good complicated. Question. <laughs> well, to sort of do it in a nugget, but um, there are times I hear from you know either of them and others, and I think, okay, that's sort of gratuitous. It's not quite witty enough. Uh, it, it's a little bit of a shock thing. And then there's other times you kind of go, okay, there's something quite clever about that. There's something very witty, or so it does depend on the individual gag. Um, I think Life's Too Short with uh, Ricky Gervais was a bit of a hit and miss, and there were some some weak moments in there. Yeah. But um, I I much prefer disabled comedians doing this sort of material I think that's where we're kind of at but that doesn't mean to say if it's good and strong and, and well thought through that other comedians shouldn't do it. Yeah, Susie what about you, does it get your back up when you know, able bodied comedians who are big big stars just have sort of throw away comments about people, where, I mean Simon already talked about that little bit in his mind where he's thinking about his routine and how something might work but might have a knock on effect for somebody else, uh, they, they have done that particularly Frankie Boyle I think big time it always makes me uneasy. I tend to tend to think of of um, well, I tend to think of the taunts in the playground as what I'm is is the my preoccupation because I think it's 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 important that there's a legitimate voice about disability out there, and for me that can only come from disabled people. Yeah. Um, I actually found Ricky Gervais's show less offensive than I had originally anticipated. Um, I thought it was actually quite well acted. I'm not sure that Ricky Gervais was portraying a disabled person, a man with learning difficulties. I think he was portraying an outsider as much as anything else. Yeah. Um, but there's a really fine line and there's a lot of thought that has to go in to make sure that your depiction of disability is something that moves us on and doesn't push us back. Yeah. So what we're saying then, to, to sort of like bring things forward, we want to see somebody who is good enough to be, you know, in Michael McIntyre's comedy roadshow. Simon, would something like that, you know, p push disabled comedians' head leaps and bounds? Yes. I mean, the bit that often comedians say is that you you start writing stuff about what you really know. That's why Lee is doing a lot around his impairment. As yeah. he sort of matures and gets sort of smarter, he will broaden out uh, and broaden out the material which is absolutely fine but um, so yes I mean that would be fantastic I think he's he's cracked it in terms of that technology yeah. I'm intrigued on a pure stand up point of view how it will go when he gets heckled or it, I mean he, yes. he had a couple of fluffs when he was with us but you had pre-programmed lines in that came out really well so they were sort of improvised but they couldn't be because they were pre-planned yeah. but um, I, yes it would be lovely to sort of see him sort of mainstream stuff and other comedians as well because there's a lot of them it's not just Lee yeah, and even um, something like Susie, you know, sitcoms, you know, not necessarily a disabled sitcom, but more, you know, dis disabled people in something like that. Oh, yeah. And being I mean, funny. There's there's yet to be a decent sitcom with a prominent disabled disabled character. I think yeah. there's so much room to do stuff that not, that's not been done on TV, but is because I think TV is quite cautious yeah. about how far it can go. Yeah. Just final word to you, Michael. Do you think something like that would make a, a difference to how people perceive you in everyday life? Yeah, yeah. I think it would be good to highlight the problems that people with a, a disability has. Yeah. Uh, like a magazine show or else, as you say, a comedy show. Yeah. Uh, I think that would be... That would be good, but, uh, you know, I think most of the TV companies are a bit unsure what, um, how to do it and yeah. how to, um, yeah, go about it. Sure, yeah. they just have to make that leap. Well, look, thank you all very much indeed for joining me today, Michael McEwen, Susie Fitton and Simon Minty. Thank you very much indeed.